Okay, well, I think we will probably get started here and we'll see if other people will kind of trickle in. We'll just keep letting them in as, as we go. Um, but welcome to our panel um, and breakout session discussion about the story of plastic. Um, really hope you all enjoyed this film. It, um, I really found it very intriguing um, to, to be watching this. Um, and, and I actually had my eight-year-old son watch along with me and he really found it interesting too and had a lot of good questions <laughs> that, that came out of this. Um, but so we're really excited to have you guys all here with us. Um, and just as a couple of housekeeping rules, if we can try to make sure everyone is making sure that they're muting themselves. And so with that, if you look down in your lower left corner, there's like a little microphone um, that kind of is going up and down if there's any noise coming from your, from your speaker. And then there's also a stop video. Um, at this point, at least, please, if you can make sure that you're muted, um, if you prefer to stop the video, and then that way we're not seeing what, what you're seeing, um, because remember that this is a meeting and not a webinar style, so everyone can see what's kind of going on around you, so um, just kind of a, a reminder from that standpoint. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Peter Bogart, who's going to kind of introduce um, the team who helped put this together, as well as introduce our panelists. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> Again, my name is Peter Bogart, and I'm here tonight representing Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, of the partners, we were the lead organization to help pull this together. <clears throat> but also thank you to uh, all the hope we're get, help we're getting through uh, Hope College Green Team, League of Women Voters, and Macatawa Creation Care. But um, we're really thankful for four really fine panelists who have joined us tonight. Uh, we'll be introducing Dr. Brian Bodenbender, who is chair of the Department of Geology and Environmental Sciences at Hope College. He has studied plastic and microplastic pollution on Lake Michigan shorelines and tributaries for the last four years. Trained as a paleontologist, his approach to environmental problems is informed by the background knowledge that, get this, most highly successful species are now extinct. Also with us tonight is Kelly Goward, who is the Environmental Program Manager at Makatawa Area Coordinating Council, uh, where she's focused on restoring and protecting Lake Makatawa's water quality. She conducts public education, organizes volunteer activities, coordinates restoration projects, and assist the Holland area communities to improve their stormwater management. Joining the, the team is gonna be Steve Mulder. In 2015, Steve became the West Michigan Regional Coordinator for the CRC's Climate Witness Project. He has since become the coordinator of the project, which is focused on engaging congregations in the United States and Canada in creation care and especially climate change. They focus on four areas, energy stewardship, education, worship, and advocacy. Joining the panel is Jacob Van Roost, who is a senior at Holt College studying chemistry. He is one of two co-presidents of the Hope Advocates for Sustainability, and he intends to attend graduate school to study green chemistry. So thank you to all the panelists who are going to help us uh, process the film we watched online. And maybe just an opening question to each one of you. In viewing the film, was there one particular thing that grabbed your attention? Was there something that was a new idea that you latched onto or an image that your mind just wouldn't let go of? Maybe Brian, if we could start with you. Certainly. Uh, this is actually my second time seeing the film. I saw it earlier this summer. And I guess the thing that's, that struck me the second time uh, more than the first was the, the influence of consumerism in driving the entire problem of um, plastic pollution. And so um, again, that's, that's pretty out there, pretty upfront in the film uh, when you watch it the first time, but it's even more striking the second time looking at that theme. A um, couple of other smaller things showed up in the film that I had noted the first time as well. One was um, one of the pot potential solutions for uh, plastic pollution is incineration. 
And the film doesn't do a very balanced uh, view of incineration. It's showing incineration in India without pollution controls. We have plastics incineration in Grand Rapids, for example, right now. And so that's a potential solution um, that's kind of uh, glossed over a little bit in this in the film. Um, having said that, though, uh, 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 flip side to the incineration thing is that another way of looking at this is that incinerating plastic is really just incinerating fossil fuels after you put them in solid form. And so, um, so this is not a incineration may not be the perfect solution um, to this problem either. But it's it's something I think is worth a little more discussion, perhaps in the breakout rooms. Okay, Jacob, would you like to share with us what caught your attention? Yeah, for sure. So uh, one of the things that really caught my attention were the deliberate shots of plastic waste that clearly had discernible labels of well-known companies on them, such as like Coca-Cola, Nestle, Tide, and Starbucks. Um, I, I kind of appreciate that the documentary did not shy away from this and that they were very blunt with, you know, these are some of the companies that are contributing to the problem. So that really stood out quite prominently to me. Also, the uh, juxtaposition of modern society with the newsreels from like the 1940s and 50s was very striking. Um, for me, I'm only 21 years old, so it's very difficult to imagine a world without plastic and just trying to project myself in a time in which this was a new invention. This was just getting onto the scene. That was not something I had ever considered before because plastic is such a ubiquitous material uh, throughout all 21 years of my <laughs> fairly short life right now. So those were uh, two things that really stood out to me. Steve, you've been doing some work in this area uh, in partnership with the Climate Witness Project. You wanna share, I know you've seen this film, but in watching it again, what strikes you? Yeah, um, well, I was, I was struck very emotionally by many of the images uh, in the film. Um, I, I wanted to point out too that um, Dr. Uh, Bodenbender is really a slacker uh, when it comes to studying plastics on the Great Lakes, but he's only been at it for four years. And I realized thinking about this, I've been doing this for 60 years because when I was a little kid, five years old, laying on a little towel on the beach of Lake Michigan, I was always fascinated by the sand. And I'd look at the little red ones and the little white ones and the little black ones and wonder what, what, what made those things up. And then there were the, these bigger um, kind of opaque ones that were, you know, 10 times bigger than a grain of sand. And I never knew what those were. And I found out in this film that those are nurdles. And I saw those everywhere as a little kid in the sand. And I've seen them my whole life on the, on the beach of Lake Michigan. And then, you know, when I was a little bit older, um, high school and college, and I'd be walking on the beach, I'd always find these balloons, right? With dead, you know, deflated balloons, a little Christmas ribbon tied on it. And I thought, wow, that is so annoying to me. And, and then I started to think about, well, that's, that was the first time I started thinking about this idea that there really is no away. You know, when something goes away, it goes someplace. And those balloons that we release end up in the lake, and then they end up on the shore. Anyway, I, I my, all of my thinking about plastics um, up until a few years ago was that it's an environmental issue in terms of wildlife. You know, we've all seen the turtle with the straw in his nose and the, the whales with the belly full of plastic and um, horrible images and, and very serious problem, but not nearly as, I mean, the problem is so much deeper than that. And the, the, this, the film really brought that out, that the problem goes, you know, all the way from the creation of the plastic to the use of the plastic and then to the ultimate end of the plastic. Um, and I, I think this quote came from the film, um, individual action based on your lifestyle is a great place to start, but a terrible place to end. And so that really struck me too, is it is a great place to start. And, and I've kind of I've kind of joined up with a lot of people who are very interested in trying to figure out how to limit the plastic that they consume. And it's not like a wearing a hair shirt or anything. It's, a, it's actually become a great adventure. It's a lot of fun. We compare notes and say, well, I found this shampoo that, you know, does, it's, an, it's a bar, you don't need a bottle. You know, I got, now I have toothpaste that's a little, little uh, pills that you bite on. They don't come in a plastic tube. So it's just cool, but that's nowhere near enough. It's a great starting point, but really what I, what I got from the film is we need to be focused on policy change and also um, holding manufacturers and corporate um, users of plastic responsible for what happens to the plastic after they're done with it. So um, those, are the, those are the two things that I'm focused on most now is policy change and trying to figure out how to, how to make manufacturers and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and creators of plastic responsible for the ultimate end of, that, of those uh, products. 
And your comments <clears throat> are making me think of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Muir, who founded the Sierra Club. He's kind of famous for saying that the more closely you look at any one thing in the world, you realize everything is connected to everything else. And those little nurdles you saw as a kid may be in the Pacific gyre now, but plastic, I think the film really shows it. Nothing ever stays put. It moves throughout the entire globe. And that, that was one of my takeaways. So Kelly, I wonder if you'd share some things with us um, in your, your kind of first pass reaction to the film. Right, so this was my first time watching the film and I mean, it's a lot, right? It's a lot to take in, a lot of, to digest. I have a, I don't know, five pages of notes here in front of me. Um, but I guess what I've found with the film is a lot of the issues that were discussed were not new to me, but some of the ways that they were talked about were new. Um, and, and one thing that really stood out to me um, was this idea that it's not the demand that drives the manufacturing, it's the supply. And that to me is so backward. I, it's very difficult to really just kind of wrap my head around that because you know, the government is subsidizing the oil industry. There's this huge supply. So we just keep making products from it when we don't need to. Um, I can't remember the statistic, but you know, we are already producing more plastic than the US needs. So why are we still producing plastic? Like that just blows my mind. So I, I see that that's really where the solution needs to be. Um, so I'm certainly not a, a policy expert and advocate and I applaud those who are, but um, that to me was the, the really kind of the big takeaway. Uh, my work with, you know, within this world is more on the cleanup end of things. And there was a, um, a quote about how cleanups are a great way to see um, how bad the problem is, but they're not a solution. It doesn't mean I'm gonna stop having cleanup events, but it really kind of brings into focus that you know th there's much more to it than that. Um, and you know, as an organizer of cleanup events and bringing volunteers out, you know, we can do a better job making sure people are aware of the full scale of this problem, not just come out and feel good about um, you know, helping the environment, but what are some next steps that we can take and move people to further action with your consumer behavior, but also, you know, writing letters to congressmen and, you know, those, those solid actions to get policy changes in place. Because I also found, you know, the, the video to be very over overwhelming in terms of like feeling like, oh my gosh, this is a horrible problem. What can we do about it? But there's always that, that ending of hope, right? That there are some groups out there, there is differences, are differences being made with, you know, bands, they're working. It's the, the system is changing, but it's, it's happening slowly. So um, yeah, so like you said, I'm still kind of digesting all of that, but um, definitely that whole, kind of loop of, you know, starting right at the, the manufacturing process is, um, was kind of the, the eye-opening piece of it for me. I've been a volunteer in some of your stream survey projects, but you, of course, see every single one of those projects. Do you have any sense for what kind of plastic people find in our waterways in the Makatawa watershed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, we've been doing spring and um, fall cleanups. I mean, I've been there eight years, but even before then, and we haven't really kept data, so it's more anecdotal. Um, we did just receive a grant to kind of up our cleanup efforts, so we will start keeping some data moving forward. Um, but just anecdotally from, you know, what we see, it's, I mean, it's, uh, you know, a lot of films, so like wrappers and plastic bags, um, we see a lot of those. And then like small broken pieces of plastic um, that you know may have been a you know plastic bottle at some point, um, but a lot of like just small broken pieces, colored plastics, white plastics, um, the those cigarette tips, we find a lot of those, those plastic cigarette holders. Um, but usually it's it's a lot of broken down pieces, not quite to the microplastic level. Um, but yeah, but I would say 
by and far, plastic is the largest component of what we find over other materials. Yeah. Well, I think it's one of the truisms for the folks who work on plastic um, mitigation that plastic never breaks down, it just breaks up, mm -hmm. you know, smaller and smaller. Maybe for anyone on the panel, the film did a good job, I think, of laying out kind of the breadth of the problem. In your mind, where do you think we need to begin dealing with the issue? Uh, from your perspective, where would you start? Well, I, I could start with that, um, Peter. I, I think starting with your own personal consumption is a great place to start. But as you said, it's not the, it's not the good place to end. Um, what we ended up doing um, after we got involved in you know, our own individual lifestyle changes was with policy. And so at the federal level, we encourage people to um, ask their federal legislators to support um, HR 5845, which is the um, uh, Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And then at the, at the Michigan level, there were, there were two bills in the, in the Michigan Congress, HB 5422, which uh, it, um, increases the, um, the deposit on plastic bottles from not just beer and, or the plastic end glass, not just beer and um, soda, but also um, wine and then you know, water and juice, all those things. So that was a bill that was in the, con in the state legislature. And then the other one was HB 4500, which I was just shocked to learn that Michigan has a ban on plastic bans. So in the state of Michigan, it's illegal for, for like a, a given municipality, like say Grand Rapids where I live. We, Grand Rapids can't say, we're gonna limit um, plastic bags in grocery stores, we're gonna, or we're gonna ask for a deposit or anything like that because the state has, has banned that. So this HB 4500 was a effort to repeal that ban on plastic bans. So those are the two things that we actually got involved in um, lobbying for. And so those are, that's what I would encourage folks to do is, is look for those kinds of um, places where you can insert yourself into the political process and, and lobby and talk to your legislators about it. You recently had a project where you partnered with Myers, is that right? Could you share something about that? No, oh, yeah. So that actually came out of our viewing of this film. Um, we had a at our discussion the question came up as to whether plastic was actually being recycled in um, Kent County. And so we did some research and found out that the public the Department of Public Works is actually doing a great job of recycling. And so the plastic that goes to that department is actually being used. Um, most of it's being made into um, lumber for, you know, plastic lumber, that Trex stuff that they use on a lot of, like, um, I think they make uh, picnic tables out of it and decks and things like that. Um, the other thing we found out was that uh, Meyer um, does, you can re return plastic film to Meyer for recycling. And so we encourage folks to do that. And Meyer's, at every Meyer, they have a box that says, you know, you can re re recycle plastic bags here. But they don't really, I don't know, fully publicize it and, 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 sh and tell you what all can be um, recycled. So it turns out that you can bring your, your bread bag, your grocery bags, um, you know, really any plastic film other than that real crinkly kind. Um, and then that will be bailed up by Meyer, and then they sell it and it is actually turned into this Trex lumber. So, I mean, I personally think um, recycling is, is not the answer, but it's certainly part of the answer. And it's a lot better to turn it into, a, a lot better to reduce the use of it in the first place. But if you're gonna use it, it's better to, to recycle and have it turned into lumber. Um, and before we move on, I just wanted to kind of share with our audience that um, a couple of our HOPE Advocates for Sustainability um, interns, we've been working with Meyer and with Trex, and we're going to launch that program on campus in the spring semester, too. Um, so we'll have like a six-month window where we collect, and um, so hopefully we'll have some community partners where we can have collection sites and things like that, too. And so we're, we're excited about that. And like you said, it's not the answer, but it at least helps get that single... Um, that material through a, a, a supply chain that can really utilize it rather than sending it off to the MRFs where it may or may not get sorted out properly, so. Jacob, you're heading into green chemistry. You've got a lifetime and a career ahead of you. Do you have some thoughts about where should solutions to this problem begin? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, so one of my favorite quotes is conquer yourself before you conquer the world. Unfortunately, that quote isn't as uh, effective now because as Mr. Mulder pointed out, we kind of need to get involved in a more of a policy standard. Um, and so what I would recommend, at least for students, especially my age, to get involved in your immediate community because that can be a more digestible problem to go after. If you try to go for, you know, national scale policy can be very difficult. You know, starting off on a smaller scale could be more effective. So for example, you know, through my Hope Advocates for Sustainability organization, we've been trying to implement more sustainable policies right on Hope's college's campus. And I find that faculty and staff at college communities are very receptive of student-led ideas. So if there's any students in the audience, I would say, at least in the immediate future, try to get involved on projects right here on Hope College or in your respective collegiate institutions. And more on a broad scale, especially with green chemistry, we're, we're hoping to transition more towards a circular economy and a circular waste stream rather than a linear economy. And uh, the Plastic Story documentary had those excellent demonstrations of kind of the life cycle of plastic, you know, starting from where it's pumped out of hydrocarbon sources and then immediately ends up in the household and eventually out into uh, nature. It's just this linear stream. And so what green chemistry is trying to look for is how can we make that instead of linear, circular, which is what the documentary also suggests at the end. So for example, over at University of Michigan, there's a doctor named Dr. Ann McNeil, who's looking at different ways to recycle plastics, not on the micros macroscopic level, but on the microscopic level. So like breaking up the polymers into their individual units and be able to rearrange those. So there's lots of different ways that you can chemically break down plastics and actually break them down rather than break them up. And so they're working on that. I know that Dr. Julia Kahlo of over at Northwestern University is looking at like light mediated. So you can use light to catalyze breaking up uh, plastics. So those are kind of two examples of how chemistry is being used to kind of solve this uh, plastic problem. Okay. Ryan, the word nanoplastics is new to my vocabulary. But I understand that's an area where you focus. Is that something we need to pay more attention to? So, um, yeah, I, nanoplastics are super, super tiny. Um, there's microplastics, which is less than a millimeter or so. And the nanoplastics are, are really, really microscopic. Um, I think it's an area of concern. It's certainly something that we need to, to focus on. Um, there are no real obvious solutions there. Um, so, so I think it's an area that's, that's has more questions and more study than, than solutions right now. So I, I think that, um, a couple of the solutions to think about are, um, again, what we've just been talking about, reducing the production on the production end, reducing use, and then being more intentional about our waste as well, because, you know, any plastic waste that escapes into the environment will eventually be microplastic or, you know, potentially is nanoplastics, so really, really tiny ones. So um, I guess the, the, a place to start in doing that is to just kind of start thinking about plastic as a hazardous waste. Um, if it escapes in the environment, it's going to do harm. And so if you're going to be using plastic, uh, be sure that when you've used it, when you finish that use, that it goes to the right place. And that's, that's kind of maybe one way to begin thinking about it. And if you solve the, the, the plastic waste problem at the large scale, then you reduce that problem when, they're, when the pieces are tiny. Kelly, let's forget all these other people who are running for president and put you in charge. Given that kind of power, where would you start to take on a problem like this? Boy, I don't know, I can handle that much power. Um, <laughs> but I, I think you really have to start at the, the very basic level and with you know information and education, right? If people don't know what the, the problem is, then how do they know what they can do? So I think having more kinds of, you know, groups like this, um, you know, encouraging watching films, reading books, whatever, to, you know, make sure people are informed about the issue and then letting them know where they can go for more, like what local groups can they get involved with? What state groups can they get involved with? Because um, I think that's always the, 
kind of the scary thing is, you know, well, what can I do by myself? Well, you're not in it by yourself. There are all kinds of people out there that are already active and can help you, um, you know, help you write a letter, help you talk to a, a senator, um, you know, what, whatever it may be. So I think that's really where it, it starts with making sure people have access to the information um, and then knowing what the steps are that they can take to make a solid difference. Um, and, and I know that's something we struggle with in, with all kinds of, of issues is, you know, where is that one source that people can go to get that information? You know, is there a, a website that's a clearinghouse that all that information is available, is easy for people to find? And usually the answer is no. Um, and so I think maybe, you know, a, a group like this is a, a good place to start. Right. We've got a lot of people here that have experience in different um, arenas, and I'm looking forward to having, you know, some some group discussion and hearing from community members that may have ideas that we haven't thought of. Um, and I think that that's really where it needs to start is, you know, getting informed, having conversations, and then big ideas come out of those those small small actions. Thank you. I'd like to return to uh, that perspective that. Jacob offered during his introduction. At his age, he's never seen a world without plastic. Do we need to return to a world like that? Can we envision a world without plastic? Is that even possible? I wonder, Brian, if you could kind of help us think through that. Sure. I, I think one thing to recognize is that um, one of the reasons plastic is so popular, um, it's not all driven by the supply. Um, some of the some of the you know main consumer type uses are driven by that. But plastic is a really remarkable material that can be tuned to do lots of different things. You can make it so that it's flexible. You can make it so the air can't pass through it or water can't pass through it. Or you can make it rigid. You can make it um, see through. Um, so it's a really, really adaptable and useful material. It has really good uses. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the, the first thing. The, I think um, to go back to a world with plastic, you certainly can, but in many ways it would be less efficient. And so if you think about uses, you know, one of the things about plastic is that it's light. And so if you think about anything that has to be transported, it makes sense if your truck bumpers are made of plastic instead of being made of iron. It's going to be more fuel efficient and you know, in the long run, probably more environmentally sound to make, you know, parts of your car out of plastic than mm -hmm. you know have woods on wood on the side of your station wagon um so you know there are good reasons to use plastic but then there are also um poor reasons to use it so the single use plastics things where you use it once and then throw it away that's you know a very poor use of a permanent material i mean the plastic is is permanently with us once it's made until we we burn it or chemically break it down and so um, I think, you know, to, to go back to the question, can we return to a world without plastics? I'm not sure that it's the most efficient thing to do that. But again, you have to, if we do use plastic, we have to dispose of it carefully when we're done with it and start thinking about those uses that, that are longer term. So if you're making, you're making things out of this permanent material, it's something you expect to reuse over and over again. And then for, um, things that are single use, then yeah, let's go to uh, other materials. So a bamboo toothbrush handle instead of a plastic toothbrush handle, that sort of thing. Um, we have alternatives and we're working on you know, additional alternatives for these single use things. And so in that sense, we could go back to some of the previous um, answers to uh, things that we do with plastic now. So cans, bottles, that sort of thing instead of plastic. Steve, I know in your personal life, you've kind of been asking yourself, can I live without plastic or can I minimize plastic? Could you kind of maybe share some things with us that, that you've done, decisions you've made? Yeah, I'll probably forget the most important ones, but the, the ones that come to mind are simple things like the, um, like um, Brian just said, the the bamboo. Um, we use tons of bamboo. And, and, and also, um, we've been using bamboo toilet paper for over a decade. Um, and now it's quite, quite easy to find and quite popular. 
So um, this isn't plastic related necessarily, but you know most of the toilet paper that, that we use comes from uh, trees being logged in the boreal forest of Canada because that's the softest uh, toilet paper you can get. So uh, bamboo um, is, a, is a good solution in my opinion. But you know, we, um, let's see, I'm thinking about this now. I, um, a lot of products now that I'm buying are, um, there's a company called, I think it's called Blue Land, um, where I get the, the squirt bottles from. And then the, the refills come in a, as a tablet. And so you put the tablet in, you put the filled thing with water, the squirt bottle, put the tablet in, and that turns into um, window washing stuff or bathroom cleaner or whatever. So you're not, you're no longer shipping um, bottles of water basically. Um, and you're, you're reusing the container that you, um, that you, you know, used to as a cleaner. And then, you know, shampoo bottles, um, toothpaste tubes. Um, we're not, we're not using any, um, you know, the, the, all the detergents we use are uh, coming either paper containers and then um, don't have it, don't have that little plat, you know, those little, those little things that you could put in your dishwasher and in your um, laundry that are, that appears to be a, like a little plastic, a little tiny plastic pellet. Well, that is plastic around that thing. When you put that in there, that gets dissolved and goes into the water system. So these are just the, the, the uh, compacted material itself without the little plastic thing around it. Just some examples. But what's been cool about it um, is, is just being part of a group of folks that, that are sharing these things with each other and, and, and finding out more and more about it as you go. So it really is an adventure and it's, it's been a lot of fun. Okay. Kelly, do you have any thoughts? World without plastic or? Well, and that was something that um, struck me in the video um, and Brian mentioned um, single use plastics how, um, let me see, I wrote it down. Um, they're not an essential part of our lives, right? And it, it, it really struck me about um, the, the use of like the single use, like sachets, they call them. I've never heard those little packets referred to as that and, and how it's, um, you know, just kind of blown up in other parts of the world. Um, but I, I think it, it definitely is possible. I think there are certainly, some challenges to think through, especially with food packaging, because I think that's that's a big place, right? There, there's a lot of waste that comes with food packaging. Um, and, you know, things like buying in bulk can help um, prevent some of that now. And, you know, and I've, I've bought um, cloth bags and take to the grocery store with me so I can avoid getting plastic bags. Um, so I think it's it's possible. Um, and again, like Brian had mentioned, you know, there are certain aspects that plastic is very useful. So I think it's sorting out, you know, where can we live without plastic? Where can we find substitutes? Um, where can we, you know, use more effectively recycled materials like glass and, and aluminum? And we can make those choices already. Um, it's again, making informed choices, letting people know that they, they have the choice. Um, so I, I think it's it's certainly possible in a in a consumer world and in certain aspects of our life to to go, go plastic free. Um, the one thing that you know I, I think about and probably a lot of us do too is you know that wasn't addressed in the the movie is what about toys? Like kids' toys are full of plastic. And you know, sometimes they're reused, given away. A lot of times they end up in the trash. So what, what do we do about those kind of materials that you know, weren't even addressed? They talked a lot about um, food packaging. And so I think we can address that, but what about all these other plastic materials that you know, are there substitutes? What else can we um, look for to, to reduce our dependency on plastic? If I may, I have actually uh, a couple of suggestions for decreasing plastic usage. Um, right ahead. So the first one I've been doing, I did for about three weeks or so uh, earlier on in the summer. And what it entails is you get a sheet of paper and you just put it on your fridge and you mark down all of the things that you throw away in your trash. And so what this allows you to do is it allows you to literally see, also you can see how quickly the list fills up, see how much you're throwing away, but you can effectively pick up on patterns of what you're tossing in the garbage. So for example, for me over the summer, I would notice that like just like bags of plastic bags that had carrots in them. Like I had that three weeks in a row. I was like, why am I doing this when I can just buy bulk carrots? And that wasn't apparent to me until I started seeing that pattern. Uh, so that's a very simple and easy thing you can do. 
Another thing that's a little more extreme that I've been doing since uh, August 9th is I actually collect all the plastic waste that I produce. So I compost all my food scraps. I recycle through the city of Holland. I also cycle paper with Hope Cobbs. They have plastic uh, or they have receptacles for recycling paper. Everything else that doesn't fit those three criteria, I put in this plastic bin in my apartment, in my, in my room, in my apartment. And so what this does is it makes you responsible for the waste that you produce. So in that documentary, we saw like these communities that are just ravaged by plastic waste. And this is a very small microcosm of that situation. So now when I shop at Aldi or the farmer's market, I have to think, you know, if I buy this bag of oats with a plastic bag, I have to deal with that plastic bag because I can't just toss it away. And so I've been doing this since August 9th. So for the past two and a half months, I've been slowly accumulating this small, you know, collection of plastic in my room. What's nice about it as well is over the span of two and a half months, I haven't contributed any plastic or any waste to the landfills. I've just used the recycling bags they give you for Holland. So I would definitely recommend using the refrigerator list if you are willing to. And then if you really wanna try it, try the plastic bucket where you collect all your plastic. It really gives you a visual of how much waste is really accumulated just by your own natural lifestyle. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are nearing the end of our time here for the panel, but um, it appears to me that our conversation is drifting into the direction of environmental justice. And one of the things that struck me in the film was that connection between poverty and trash. Poor people can't afford to, to evade it. You know, we live in a country with 4% of the world's population producing a great share of this trash that ends up burdening the lives of other people. And I think somehow there's a moral question in there about how we live our lives. And I think, Jacob, I agree with you, inventory is a good thing, but we need to inventory everything we do and understand how that impacts other people and then be willing to say, should I keep doing that? And um, that involves change, which is an awful word for human beings, but I do think Ultimately, we're going to have to also deal with the moral and ethical issues because I'm not going to change unless I believe I should, um, unless you force me into it. So to all of our panelists, thank you so much. Um, I've appreciated the, the breadth and the depth of uh, the knowledge that you brought to this conversation. And um, we're going to, I guess, um, we'll go to breakout rooms at this point. But um, the thought was we'll get into breakout rooms where you as uh, part can be now be participants and begin to raise some of the questions you may have related to the film. Yep, so at the bottom of your screen, um, Leo's gonna be putting in the breakout session um, button at the very bottom. Um, so you should see that here shortly. Um, so we are gonna break people up into Hope College students as well as um, Greater Holland Area community members. So we'll allow you to kind of self-select, um, but myself, um, Steve Baumer pettiger Jacob and Brian Bowden-Bender will be in the Hope College one. And then Steve, Kelly and Peter and um, Deb will be in the community um, section. So we can kind of help facilitate some, but at this point you can start to self-select at that point. All right, um, I think we'll hear a little report out from our group from Jacob and Brian, if that's okay. Yeah, so we um, we had a lot of, fortunately we had a lot of HOPE students in our uh, our section. So we kind of talked about their reactions to the, um, to the documentary and a lot of common themes were just, we were amazed at just the sheer quantity of trash produced. And Michelle and Dr. Bowden-Bender uh, described how like, when you see all the trash at the recycling incinerate or the uh, plastic incineration facility up in Grand Rapids, you know, you see just this huge train picking up all this trash and dumping it. And just so, just the magnitude of plastic produced is really mind boggling. Um, one student talked about how it was surprising how we've kind of diverted our trash and plastic problem to China. We would just sip, shift all our, or ship, excuse me, all of our recycling to, you know, a foreign area to have it be processed and just say, you know, we'd rather not deal with it. So we're just gonna push it somewhere else, which is not a very prudent uh, way to deal with that problem. Uh, we discussed different sustainability topics on campus here at Hope College as well. One of the main concerns is um, dining services right now, because unfortunately they have to use 
non-reusable containers and plastic bags and single-use plastic silverware. So we developed a couple strategies for how we can minimize our plastic consumption in that area, specifically with using reusable bags or using si or and reusable silverware. We commented on the three big R's of um, sustainability of plastic, the reduce, reuse, recycle, and also how those three R's in a, are in a certain order where we should prioritize reducing first and then reuse if we have to. And as a last resort, recycle. Uh, and then an extra R that we talked about is uh, refuse. So just before even using the plastic, just refuse to use it and say, I will not be using this product because it's just, it's not ecologically prudent to use it. Um, and Dr. Bodenbender talked about an interesting way, uh, interesting recycling method that's going on in Europe. Uh, Dr. Bodenbender, could you share that with everyone? Sure. Uh, we were talking about the idea of, of promoting taking back more and making our recycling uh, more efficient or, or higher quality so that more can be recycled. And so in Europe, there are, um, well, we have machines where we can take back plastic bottles, right? You know, um, drink bottles. In Europe, they have the same sort of thing, but it's more things with barcodes. So you bring back your shampoo bottles, you bring back your butter tub or whatever else, and you basically sort your waste at the place where you buy your next product and that you know gets sorted into higher quality, more easily recycled um, feedstock for the next round of using that material. So that's you know that was just an example of a solution that's out there already that we could be doing more to look and see, can, is that something we could adopt um, ourselves? We don't have to invent it, it's already invented. It's just a matter of, of applying it in our particular situation. Thank you. Um, Peter, um, do you wanna kind of share what your group talked about or um, designate one of your um, respondents? You're muted. <laughs> there was following the rules and staying muted. Um, I'll share a couple things and then um, let folks kind of fill in the blanks after that. But we kind of asked ourselves initially reactions to the film because people were kind of feeling uniformly. It just had an emotional impact. Um, one of our folks shared beyond emotional impact, I felt depressed afterwards that you just kind of, if you weren't aware of the problem, if you were privileged not to have to deal with this problem, it was just kind of stunning to recognize how big of a problem it is and how heavily it falls on some people in other countries. And so kind of dealing with the emotive nature of that. Um, you know, I shared with folk the one image I cannot shake is that plastic straw being pulled out of that sea turtle's nose. That just, I mean, you can talk about, yeah, plastic straws, big deal. Very small percentage of plastic waste, da, 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 da. But when you see that straw and the damage it really does, that just was an emotive moment for me. We did also spend some time talking about something we could constructively do ourselves immediately. And the challenge was, can I identify something I can do tomorrow that would somehow deal with a plastic pro problem? And is there somebody I could invite to join me in doing that? Um, Jacob, you were a real uh, backbone of that conversation. You know, I, I was bringing back to our, our focus that need to do inventory and auditing because the homes we live in are so familiar to us that we literally cannot see the content of the home anymore. Um, I shared with folks my experience when I was in, in home energy retrofit. I would challenge homeowners to tell me what the pattern was of the wallpaper in their room, in their bathroom. They can't do it. Your home is so familiar to you you're so habituated to that space, you literally cannot see anything anymore. So you have to kind of consciously, intentionally take stock. And uh, I was encouraging folks to follow that practice. So some of the other, other folks, you may want to chip in.
or not. <laughs> I'll just share one other thing from our group was that we talked about maybe um, collectively writing some more letters for some of those policy things um, and bans to our state legislature. And um, Steve did send me those in the chat. So I'm gonna send those out to everyone here um, just so you all have those, those numbers um, for those different policies and things like that. So you should all be able to grab those and maybe copy and paste those into another area. But maybe that's something that we could collectively try to, to do as a group and um, put a certain day that we wanna try and do it. Like um, America Recycles Day is November 15th coming up. So maybe if that would be something we could all try to make a commitment that we would write to someone on that day or something along those lines. I think that that'd be kind of a, a neat thing to try and do and get other people to do it. Say, I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna get two other people to do it, so. Michelle, yeah. one, of our, one of our folks indicated willingness to do new disciplines at home, but only if he could be reassured that it actually got recycled. And I suspect that's a topic living sustainably along the lake shore is gonna take up on November 10. Did yep. you so, say, any, say anything about that? Um, I have not yet. So I have some slides that I'll put up here in just a minute. They have a couple of other kind of upcoming call to actions and ways of getting involved. So I think Steve had something to say, and then maybe we'll kind of open it up if anybody else had any final thoughts, and then I'll share those couple of slides. Yeah, I was just going to share, uh, Michelle, that I think that's a great idea to work with other people to, to do like a, what we ended up doing after we showed the film was um, we connected with Sierra Club. And they were doing a virtual lobby day um, and, and that was not as effective or as interesting as actually going to Lansing and talking to legislators, but it's a whole lot easier. Mm -hmm. So we had people just, um, you know, send emails and, and call their legislators and tell them about this, this legislation and say that, 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 that we're hoping that they'll support it. So that okay. would be something you could do as a group. Okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's something that we can talk a little bit more about and then I'll send it out to everybody who um, was on the email list for, for registering for today. And obviously it's do it if, if you, if you're able to. So yep, that sounds great. Any other final comments or thoughts from anybody? Michelle, I'd like to just challenge folks. In the end, the, the question is you can be attuned to these issues and concerned about these issues, but do you really mean it? And so I, I would like to ask if Holland would double the cost of trash pickup, would you be willing to pay it in order to eliminate the plastic problem? Mm -hmm. Now, nobody's talking about that, don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, but, Aaron's gonna get some phone calls tomorrow. Yeah, but somewhere along the line, you've gotta have skin in the game and you have to really want to solve the problem. And there, there's going to be a cost for doing that. There's going to be a change in your lifestyle. There'll be a change in your wallet. But is it enough of a problem that we say that's a price worth paying? Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, any of these kinds of things that if you want to see the change, I mean, there, like you said, there's a cost that's going to kind of go along with it. And one of those is going to be convenience a lot of these times. I mean, we're talking about single use plastics. I mean, our little yogurts that are easy for us to take and then dispose of um, is, is just one example. So, um, so hopefully we can all kind of live with a little bit more of a sacrifice on that convenience and, um, and, and learn from this film and kind of commit to that personally. Yeah. I think this is the point where we need to connect with, with what Steve Mulder said earlier in his own personal life as he's engaged in doing these disciplines at home and changing away from what may have been convenient. He's a happier person. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Bible refers to as joy. When you <laughs> live in congruence with your values, you experience joy. That's different than happiness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Leo, could you put up those couple of slides real quick for me? Thank you. 
So um, these are just a couple of other things that are coming up. Um, so the Story of Plastic on their website, um, the storyofplastic.org, they had a backslash take action website or um, page. And on there, there was a bunch of lists of other things that people can, can do as individuals or collectively. So I'd encourage you to take a peek at that. Um, the Kreisinga Art Museum at Hope College is partnering with the Big, Sh Big Reed Lakeshore Group um, and that has been going on for the past month. And then this will also run through um, November 21st, I believe. Um, but it's an exhibit called Dominion Over the Earth. And it is really impactful to kind of see some of these um, paintings and art pieces that people have done over the years um, in relationship to the um, impacts that people have on the earth. So there's things from like bees to the oil industry to tree har over har harvesting, all kinds of different things. So I'd encourage you to check it, check that out. And that is a free virtual exhibit. So you can just go to the Kreisinger Art Museum website. And again, it's just a, a free virtual one. You can just kind of do it on your own pace. Um, and then on November 10th, um, as part of America Recycles Day, which is actually November 15th, um, the Living Sustainably Along the Lakeshore group is doing a um, celebration and stump the recycling chumps. So any kind of questions that you might have about is this recyclable or not or whatever, um, bring those questions to that event and that's a live event where we have our City of Holland Recycling Coordinator as well as someone from um, Republic Services and a couple of other people who work um, in the recycling industry locally to kind of talk about avenues for recycling some of those strange things and new practices that are coming along. So that's out there. Um, and then the, one of the groups that Kelly is organizing is this Lakeshore Cleanup Coalition. Um, and so we are starting to post some web or some events for spring 2021 out there. Um, this is kind of not, not the best time to be doing beach cleanups and things. It's not the most enjoyable. So, so we're kind of starting to do programming planning for, for the springtime. Uh, but feel free to reach out to Kelly directly for that too. And then um, also giving a plug for um, the program that she oversees, the Makatawa Watershed Program in their annual meeting, which is November 16th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. So definitely be sure to check all of those things out. And um, if you obviously you can't click on all those links, but feel free to email me if there's any any of those in particular that you want more details about. You should all have received an email from me either yesterday or today. And with that, just kind of saying a thank you for joining us um, and for taking the time to watch this film. I really do hope um, you got a lot out of it. I think it was a really impactful film and just kind of hope that you'll continue to learn and engage in this and um, kind of help share the knowledge with other people. Um, thank you, Peter and the Citizens Climate Lobby for helping to sponsor the, the film itself. And then our partners, um, our green team, League of Women Voters Holland Area, and then the Tower Creation Care Group to help put tonight on for us. And Leo, thank you so much for being here for us. This would not have happened so smoothly without you. I cannot say thank you enough. <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> Have All a great right. night, everybody. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.